Clubs around the African continent are this weekend competing in the CAF Champions League preliminary round. We bring you results and previews of all the teams. Hello and a very warm welcome to Matchpoint CCTV's program that brings you African sports from across the continent and beyond. I'm Mahe Mutua also coming up this half hour. Kenya on the defensive as international community piles pressure on athletes and urges for more in the fight against doping. And we look at the African participation in the Winter Youth Olympic Games taking place in Norway. Well, let's start with some soccer news. Let's quickly get you some results from the CAF Champions League and Confederations Cup this evening. Most matches are now underway. Earlier, though, Tanzania's young Africans beat Cercle de Joachim 1-0. Uh, Gormahia of Kenya lost 2-1 to Synapse of Madagascar, while Zimbabwe's Chicken Inn scored a surprise win against South Africa's Mamelodi Sundowns. Uh, meanwhile, South Africa's two representatives in the Confederations Cup Got off to a strong start. Bidvest Vitz won 3-0 against Light Stars FC of the Seychelles, while Ajax Cape Town beat Sagrada Esperanza 2-1 in Angola. Meanwhile, Ugandan champions Vipers Football Club have made a good start in their Champions League debut, beating former champions Enyimba International of Nigeria. Eria Seki Sambu's solo effort handed the Ugandan side a 1-0 win in, their first, in the first leg of their encounter in Uganda's capital, Kampala. Leon Senyange now reports. It was the first ever meeting between the two sides and Nyimba came into the match with a better pedigree, twice African club champions. Vipers, on the other hand, fielded a number of first-timers in the competition. And it's the Vistas that came close to breaking the deadlock. Shinedu Joseph's effort from a set piece was cleared off the line. All traffic flowed in Nyimba's way as the Nigerians piled the pressure on their hosts. But in Nyimba's forwards barely did justice to their own efforts. Abelugu Andrew missed another opportunity from within distance. Those missed chances would come back to haunt the Nigerians when the hosts took the lead minutes after the break. Eria Sambu's run down the left opened up in Nyimba's defense and allowed him poke home the only goal of the match. It's a very important league and uh, we expect uh, to do the same as well when you go to Nigeria. We are very focused, uh, we are going to, to prepare very well, uh, we shall be doing uh, very good training. They had one chance and scored. We had like five chances and couldn't score. But congratulations to them. We shall just have to go back home, concentrate on the next game and qualify. The early advantage has already sparked some self-assurance among Vipers a team with a squad that has not tested continental club football before. The man in charge, George Beston Simbe, knows too well what could keep his side going forward. The character of the determination that they can do, because when you see these are still young boys, most of them is their first time to future in this tournament. And I know with the time they will be good players. The two sides meet again in a fortnight. But it's the Ugandan champions that carry more confidence into the second leg and bear the more realistic chance of progressing to the next round of the competition. Leon Senyange, CCTV, Kampala. And looking ahead, the CAF Champions League first leg continues on Sunday across the continent as teams try to gain an early upper hand. Club Africain of Tunisia welcome Association Sportive de Tanda of Côte d'Ivoire in the capital Tunis. Kaiser Chiefs of South Africa will be visiting the Comoros Islands to face hosts Vulcan Club de Moroni. St. George of Ethiopia play Saint Michel United of Seychelles. Wari Wolves of Nigeria who unveiled 13 new players on Friday will play host to Club de Sporting de Praia Cruz from Sao Tome et Principe. Well, now to talk us through the return of CAF Champions League action, we're now joined live from Lagos, Nigeria, by Toby Olubi, a sports analyst and football coach in Nigeria. Now, uh, uh, Toby, obviously, Nigeria is represented by two clubs, Enyimba and Wari Wolves. Following Enyimba's loss yesterday, what are the chances for Nigeria at this tournament? Uh, well, uh, Enyimba's loss was um, due to the um, fact that uh, the Nigerian teams have not started their season, so they are a bit sluggish. And um, 
it was obvious with the way we were missing chances in the game against Vipers of Uganda. But luckily, it was just a one new defeat. So when they get over to the uh, return leg later in the month, um, they'll be playing it in, in Port Harcourt. Uh, and I hope uh, the, the guys from Ayimba will be able to overturn the deficit and uh, just get the, the victory. While uh, Wari Wolves will be playing against the guys from South Tome and Principe, Sporting Paria, uh, 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 it's going to be a home game tomorrow. So I, I hope uh, Wari Wolves will be able to get uh, a victory in, in that one. Now, Toby, obviously we've seen a couple of upsets, including that one where Vipers beat Enyimba. Of course, Zimbabwe's chicken in a surprise side beat uh, South Africa's established side, uh, Mamelodi Sundowns. Are we now seeing a shift that could see more unestablished sides grow in Africa? Of, of course, uh, it's, it's a face, and it happens every now and then. Remember, in the CAF Champions League, this will be dominated in the, in the late 90s and early 90s by Zamalek. Uh, they, they, they won about five uh, uh, CAF Champions League, and then they moved over to Al Ali of Egypt as well. Uh, they won eight times, they're the highest winners uh, in the, in the, in the, after the turn of the millennium. Uh, then it was to TP Mazembe, they won it uh, uh, five times as well, uh, three times in, after the millennium. So it just shows there's this usual change in, in phase. And uh, uh, Nigeria's Ayimba also won it back to back in 2003 and 2004. So it's, it's a phase of Tipi Mazembe that blowing teams away in their country, DR Congo. Uh, uh, they played 14 games this season and scored 39 goals, considered just four. They are second on the log, at, uh, four points behind the table leaders. So it just shows Tipi Mazembe are a team to reckon with. Now, uh, speaking of TP Mazembe, they won last year's edition while DR Congo won the Chan tournament last week in Rwanda. Uh, what can you tell us about the emergence, or rather re-emergence, of DR Congo as an African football powerhouse? Yeah, it's that time. They won the, the Chan tournament. Uh, uh, their coach, uh, Florence Mbenga, uh, is, is doing a fantastic job. Remember, DR Congo defeated uh, our Nigerian Super Eagles in a friendly match. Uh, so it's no, it's no fluke, uh, they put a lot of hard work and I think credit needs to go to former coach Claude Leroy. He did a fantastic job coaching the team in two uh, different spells, 2004 and 2000 and, uh, 2011, I think. Uh, he's done a fantastic job and his work is still in, in, uh, very obvious in the Congo. They're doing fantastically well. I think they've only lost one in the last six matches. It was against Cameroon in the uh, last group stage, a dead rubber uh, at that against Cameroon. So they're a fantastic side and I think uh, they deserve a lot of credit. Toby Olubi will keep you on the line right now as we shift focus to the Confederations Cup. Obviously, South Africa will be represented by Kaiser Chiefs, Mamelodi Sundowns, Ajax Cape Town, and Bidvest Vits in the respective continental competitions. Now, the four teams will be hoping to emulate the likes of Orlando Pirates, who are former Champions League winners and Confederations Cup runners-up. But the four representatives will know it's not going to be an easy journey to African glory, as CS Duplessis now reports. The Continental Campaign begins for many clubs this week with Champions League and Confederations Cup commitments taking centre stage. Johannesburg club Bidfest Fitz will begin their African adventure away to Light Stars FC of the Seychelles on Saturday, aiming to gain a substantial advantage into the second leg back in South Africa. But coach Gavin Hunt is not sure of what to expect against the Islanders and is looking forward to the task at hand. I think it's important for the club and... Uh, I think uh, it's important to, you know, certainly for the players to get a chance because I think it, uh, it'll help us, see them we've had a bad run in the league and I think it'll help us with a bit of a distraction playing another competition uh, with different pressures and, and, and get away from, you know, where we, the last couple of games it certainly looked like we've been a little bit anxious to want to win, want to win in the league. So maybe this is a good distraction for us, I think, to go away and play. Former Tottenham defender Bongani Kamalo says the competition is a welcome distraction from the rigours of the Premier Soccer League and that it exposes his teammates to a whole new set of challenges and environments. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a great, it's a great opportunity, you know, for the guys um, to travel, especially the young players. You know, Africa is always a different challenge and it's always good when the scenery changes. The men known as the students will be eager to improve on their last outing in the competition and captain Dylan Shepard is confident that his squad has the players to do the job this weekend. Last season we, we got a good home result and then we went away and, lo uh, and uh, lost it away. So we want to uh, obviously get through to the, the next rounds and we, like you said, we're taking a good strong team with so we're looking forward to it. Vits know that their opposition are a bit of an unknown entity and have not been able to obtain any footage of Light Stars FC in action, but it does not change the focus or the game plan that Kamalo and his teammates have put in place for the first leg encounter at the Amity Stadium in Praslin. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think that's, that's, that's a deal with most games, you know, especially when you go out in those territories. We know it'll be tough, it'll be physical. I think that comes standard when you're there. 
Um, but mostly, you know, it's just, you know, they basically just suss him out the first 10 minutes and then do our best to win the game. This will be the Clever Boys' fourth foray into Africa. On the previous three attempts, they crashed out in the first round. They'll be desperate to get through this tricky initial period and emulate the likes of Orlando Pirates, who are runners-up in the CAF Confederations Cup last season. CS Duplessis, CCTV, Johannesburg. Well, we're still talking African club football, shifting gears now to the second tier of African continental football, the Confederations Cup. Still on the line with us from Lagos, Nigeria, is sports analyst Toby Olubi. Now, Toby, obviously no major surprises so far in the Confederation Cup matches played so far. Which uh, will be the teams, though, to look out for in this year's edition? Well, I think it's um, Aqua United of Nigeria. I want to uh, just stick up my neck out there for them. They finished in the league last season, uh, 15th. Uh, but this season, in the preseason tournament organized by the Football Federation, uh, the Super 4 tournament, they won it um, ahead of the likes of Aimba and uh, Wari Wolves and uh, National Aqua United. So I think they, they are really hungry for it this season. Uh, they are going to be playing at home against um, uh, the club from uh, uh, Congo, Peter Club. Uh, I think if they can get a good result at home uh, against Vita Club, I think it's going to be a good way to start. Uh, finally, Toby, obviously the defending champions, Etwalji Sahel from Tunisia, are not uh, taking part in the Confederations Cup this time. They're obviously playing in the Champions League. Could this now be a chance uh, for the other two Tunisian clubs, uh, Esperance and uh, Stade Gabessien, to make a mark? Yes, it's a good opportunity. Uh, it has decided we'll also be playing in the CAF Super Cup against TP Mazembe of Congo. Uh, it's a good opportunity for the other Tunisian clubs. Uh, we've, also, we've always known the Tunisian clubs to be very deadly in the continent, also with the Egyptians. Uh, so I'm sure they're going to blow other teams apart. But I'm just sticking out my neck for my Nigerian team, Aqua United, uh, with the addition of Jude Aneke, uh, who used to be the, who is the record um, goal scorer in the Nigerian Professional League. I know it's going to fire them into glory this season. All right, Toby, indeed, it will be only time will tell. We'll see how the Nigerian teams uh, progress in both the CAF Champions League and Confederations Cup. That was sports analyst and football coach Toby Olubi joining us live from Lagos, Nigeria, talking to us about continental club football. Well, it's time for us to take a quick break here on Match Point. Here's what's coming up. Kenya on the defensive as international community piles pressure on athletes and the country is urged to do more in the fight against doping. Kenya's National Olympic Committee has faulted the international community for piling undue pressure on the country as they continue to set up anti-doping structures. On Thursday, World Anti-Doping Agency, WADA, said Kenya was being placed on a watch list of nations at risk of breaking its code. This after the country failed to meet the set deadline to prove that it is tackling doping. But the country's Olympic Committee says they are happy with the progress on the ground. The doping scourge is a threatening to taint Kenya's glorious athletics heritage. A day after new bribery allegations were made by two banned athletes of an athletics official, the World Anti-Doping Agency has added another twist. WADA put the East African running powerhouse on notice after the country failed to meet a deadline set to prove they are clamping down on cheats. With the Olympics just six months away, there are fears that the country could be found non-compliant, putting its real participation in limbo. As NOC, I think we are happy with the progress that is being made. We could have uh, provided uh, uh, hastened, but then there are no shortcuts in in making of, of, of laws in this country. So, I, I, and, I, and I think it will be unfair for them to continue condemning us. WADA has now given Kenya two more months to complete this process of putting the necessary infrastructure in place for its anti-doping body. Already there is financial commitment. But even with that financial commitment, 
uh, disbursement of funds cannot be done until the legal framework has been put in place. Currently, over 40 athletes are serving bans for doping violations in a country where track and field forms the core of its Olympic participation. At the 30th Olympiad in London, Kenya won 11 medals, and only two of those were gold. Now this year in Rio, the National Olympic Committee hopes that by diversifying the sports in which the country participates in, they can reap a better medal howl. Rugby Sevens, which makes its debut in the Olympics, will see Kenya feature in the men and women's event. The women only qualified after South Africa's Olympics body pulled out its country's team. We know. And uh, from the advice from the union is that these girls may may do even may do very well. Uh, we didn't want to go to the South African way because I think they have a wider field where they, they, they choose their athletes. Kenya's women's volleyball team, which is financially supported by the National Olympic Committee, is currently taking part in the African qualifiers in Cameroon. Besides participation, what is it that we, we are supposed to do as an NOC? First, we need to develop these other sports because over the years we have been over-reliant on a track and field only. To date, track and field remains Kenya's most successful sport at the Olympics. And after the country's impressive display at the World Championships in Beijing last year, there is expectation that Rio will be a bumper medal harvest in athletics. But that is only if the country can work within WADA's given timeline in ensuring they are compliant to the agency's code. Selassin Karone, CCTV, in Nairobi. Well, staying in the country, Kenya's police force could soon prosecute perpetrators of doping among Kenyan runners. On the occasion of the country's national cross-country championships, Athletics Kenya, along with a number of retired athletes, called on the government to act fast and save Kenya from a looming ban by the World Anti-Doping Agency. CCTV's Sadiq Shaban has more. Kenyan athletes could not have competed at a worse time than they did during the 2016 National Cross-Country Championships. But despite the country missing the global doping watchdog deadline to operationalize its anti-doping regime, hundreds of athletes turned out to compete. The National Federation says even with missed chances, Kenya is working hard to comply with weather demands. I'm confident that uh, with all the processes that have been put in place now, uh, we should be able to meet the deadline without any major problem. And therefore, I would like to ask the athletes to prepare well. Uh, they will definitely go to the Olympics. As hundreds of athletes battle for a place to the African Championships in Cameroon, Kenya's police chiefs say they are hot on the heels of those exposing the country to the doping list of shame. And as a matter of fact, we have some, some individuals whom we are taking into interest in their activities, both athletes and others associated with athletics. And uh, very soon you are going to you'll be hearing from us. Kenya's retired athletes have weighed in on the matter calling on the country's top leadership to avert a looming crisis. The president of this country, the deputy president, please let us have the legislation in place so that we save our country from being banned uh, from uh, athletics or uh, from any sports, especially in the Olympics. My big cry is to the government to come up in on board and try to help us and try to save sports in this country. During the championship, Reigning World Cross Country Champion Geoffrey Kamoror won the race and will lead the Kenyan team to Cameroon for the African Championships. Largely an occasion to display and showcase national talent, this year's Kenya Cross Country Championship have been largely low-key, perhaps a reflection of just how close Kenya has come to being declared non-compliant by the World Anti-Doping Agency for missing a crucial doping deadline. Sadiq Shaban, CCTV, Nairobi. Now, International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach has also been weighing in on the doping issue at the Winter Youth Olympic Games in Norway. The 62-year-old German former fencer says that the fight against doping needs to start when an athlete's career is still young. On Friday, he spent time connecting with young athletes at the Learn and Share facilities, where the participants undertake workshops on career development, injury prevention, and sports nutrition, while also learning about the risks and dangers of doping and illegal betting. 
is uh, about prevention and information. Uh, we have uh, to make uh, them aware about uh, the risks and, and dangers. Uh, we have to inform them how uh, they may be uh, approached, uh, how they should uh, react. Uh, and uh, we have uh, provided a hotline uh, there uh, where uh, every athlete uh, from uh, all around the world uh, can contact us at, at any time, seek advice, uh, or uh, make us aware of uh, any kind of uh, problems and then uh, we will react immediately. I think it's very important in a sport to play fair, I mean without doping, because uh, that influences your growing up and the way it plays and it's not fair be between the teams. Uh. You're watching Match Point here on CCTV Africa, here's what's still to come. We'll be taking a look at the African participation in the Winter Youth Olympic Games taking place in Norway. Welcome back. Now the Winter Youth Olympic Games are underway in Lillehammer, Norway. There is some African interest with both Kenya and South Africa each sending one athlete. South Africa's Rachel Elizabeth Olivier is a slalom skier and she hopes her qualifying will boost the profile of winter sport in her country. CCTV's Dan Williams has more from Lillehammer. 70 countries will take part in the 2016 Winter Youth Olympic Games and among them will be one athlete from South Africa. Rachel Elizabeth Olafair carries her nation's hopes in Lillehammer when she competes in the slalom and giant slalom, and she's determined to make the most of the experience. It's a great privilege to be able to represent my country and all the young athletes in my community, because I know it means quite a lot to them that I am here. It's an amazing experience to be able to represent your country. Alifair took up skiing when she was five and trained during the winter months at Tiffendale, South Africa's only ski resort. If nothing else, Rachel's achievement of being part of these games demonstrates that it can be done. And she hopes that that will inspire other South Africans to take up winter sports. It will definitely put us on the map and the world will be more aware that we, as a country that does more summer sport than winter sport, we can also do winter sport, also compete, and I think it's just amazing to be able to help to get, achieve that. That sentiment is echoed by her coach, former Olympic skier Alex Heath. I mean, she's born and bred there, she's done all her skiing there. Um, it, it gives people a little bit of hope, and, uh, and especially with our ski resort being in a, in a very underprivileged part of the country, but just her being here and qualifying is, uh, is such a huge achievement. and uh, and and being here is, is uh, going to make a huge difference for our sport in South Africa and, and uplift um, and give hope to children that, uh, that need it. Whatever happens, this could be just a lift South Africa winter sport needs. Dan Williams, CCTV, Lillehammer, Norway. Finally, moving away from the snow back to the sun, this week on our Matchpoint Top 5 segment, we count down the top five scorers at the CAF Champions League by tournament, starting at number five. Fifth position is shared by three players from different countries and clubs who each scored eight goals in one Champions League season. Egyptian forward Mohamed Abutreka was the first to do so with Al Ahli in the 2006 season. He scored the win as the Egyptians went on to win the tournament. Diyoko Kaluyituka of eventual champions TP Mazembe repeated the feat three years later before Nigerian Michael Eneramo did the same the next year with finalists Esperance Tunis. 
At fourth is Trezor Mputu. The Congolese midfielder and striker hit the back of the net nine times during the 2007 season with TP Mazembe. This is made all the more incredible by the fact that TP Mazembe didn't even progress to the group stage of the tournament, meaning that Mputu's goals all came in the first and second rounds of play. Mamadou Diallo is a Malian striker who was playing at Algerian club side USM Alger in the 2004 season. It was then that he scored 10 times to be the top scorer, beating out Espérance's Ali Zitouni, who scored 9 over the same period. Alger never made it past the group stage of that competition, while Zitouni's Espérance made it to the semi-finals, where they lost to winners Enyimba. Second on our list is Ghanaian Emmanuel Clotti. Playing for Espérance Tunis, the striker scored an incredible haul of 12 goals for the Tunisian side, which finished as runners-up to Egyptian giants Al Ahli. 2012 was the last season that an individual player in the Continental Tournament scored more than 7 goals in the season. And finally at number 1 is Steven Worgu, who scored a record 13 goals in one season. The Nigerian playing for Enyimba marked the feat in 2008, scoring 5 more goals than the closest player. His high tally of goals lifted the Nigerian club to the semi-finals of the tournament that year, where they lost to eventual champions Al Ahli. But his 13 goals put him at number one on our list of goal scorers in an individual season of the CAF Champions League. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have for you on this week's edition of Matchpoint. Remember, we'd love to hear your feedback. You can send it to matchpoint at cctv.com. You can also visit our Facebook page, CCTV Africa, become a member and leave a comment there. You can also stay in touch with us on Twitter. The handle is at CCTV News Africa. Thanks for watching. I'm Mahe Mutua. We leave you as always with our move of the week, the week which comes from the Dutch League. It's Richard Lee Bazoa's stunner as Ajax defeated arch rivals Feyenoord 2-1 on Sunday.